Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Talking Landscape Photography. Um, it's fantastic to be back live after last week's premiere, but hopefully that premiere worked really well for everybody. And, um, and it, it, I saw Tom interacting with everyone, so that was awesome. So um, tonight we've got um, Jeff Murray joining us, and we're really stoked to have him along with us. He's a, an amazing adventurer and um, really knows how to get out there and get amongst it. Um, and um, yeah, certainly, um, like, I guess, sees his horizon much further than Tasmania, where he lives, and um, has been to some pretty amazing places, and consequently has taken some pretty awesome photos as well. So um, any of you guys got something to say as well? Well, I just going to just quickly chat about the, the week gone. Oh, um, yeah. The reason, the reason Lucky, we, we, we shifted the show off live last time is Lucky got a wonderful invitation to speak on a panel about um, fine art and landscape photography at the AIPP um, boot camp, which was a really amazing, incredibly high value event that ran for three days last uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, you might even still be able to access it online. It's... Um, it cost me twenty nine dollars as a member, and I was there three days with about fifteen different events or something. It was it was crazy good. Uh, so Luke was invited to be on a panel with you know the people like Tony Hewitt, and you don't sort of turn out invitations like that in a hurry. So we asked Tom nicely to 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 do um, do one a day early, and we also was it yesterday or the day before, Lukey, We we actually did our first interview with some uh, amazing american photographers yes from that was Northwest. fantastic that was really really good so um Jared that episode Armahone. will be coming up and um no doubt um yeah it would be really interesting um to to kind of um yeah hear their perspectives and definitely um some very high quality work there it was very inspiring so yeah really good show them. really strong clean minimalist um and very emotionally evocative and thoughtful um emotion-based imagery especially from jared um, we also had the closing of the Anzang Awards on Friday. Yeah, the Australian Geographic Track. Nature Photographer of the Year. So that one finished up, but there's still um, Silver Lining Awards is um, run by the AIPP is still open. And Paul, do you have to? You don't have to be a member either, do you, to enter that one? No, it's the first year they've opened it up to everyone, and you've got to March the first, and the prizes are like awesome. Like most of the prizes for because how many categories they have, which is quite a few, are, are like you know four or five thousand dollars each just for the top prize you know and last time they went all the way back to fifth place so so in terms of bang for your buck uh and they have a phenomenal range of critique nights and uh and even critiques afterwards so so it's probably one of the best contests in the world to actually reach out and get critique on your work as as well as actually competing for good prizes so so i highly recommend that one uh it's just um it's just silver lining awards i i, I have to put look up in the chat what the website would be but it's Oh, Under the Google, it, you should be able to find really, it pretty easy, yeah. Really opening up a lot. And I was just like us, didn't enter, but Lukey and Nick did. And Nick's going for his fourth year in a row, so we'll see, see how he goes with that. And he's gotten, uh, gotten <laughs> there, have you, Nick? Yeah, I think he um he entered so many <laughs> shots that... Um, Next year, was, I'm feeling was... the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah. it's, uh, uh, we, we decided I... a little while ago we'd, we'd take a few moments at the beginning of the show to just uh, talk about the... The happenings in the landscape world and uh and our own lives a little bit so yeah i think i'm um, the other competition that's on my radar at the moment there's another astrophotography competition um i believe which closes in early march which is the um the one run out of uh, the um observatory in um greenwich in the uk so it's quite a big um, I can't actually remember the name of it, um, which is really not very handy, but it, um, it's the, basically the, the premier astrophotography competition in the world. It used to be called the Insight Astrophotography Competition, yeah. but um, if you look up the, um, the, the Greenwich Observatory, um, which is basically where Greenwich Mean Time comes from, so it's kind of cool to have that all associated. Um, yeah, it's a very prestigious competition, so if you're into astrophotography, it's a really good one to, to look into as well, and I believe, I'm pretty sure the entries are free, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, you don't get yeah, too right. many competitions these days, and it's certainly with nice. Ozgeo, yeah, I think the first entry was $32 and was 38. 34 or something, and 22 after that, so it wasn't wasn't particularly cheap. I'm sure Nick's um, going to have to do a few overtime yeah, shifts to, to cover all of his entries. But, um, yeah. <laughs> I've been, Max out the credit card there, Nick. I needed a couple of images, mate, but I'll break even, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. That's a good way of looking at it, return on investment. So, um, yeah, no, awesome. What have, what have you been up to otherwise, Paul? You did some shooting on Bruni Island? 
Oh, what did I do? Oh, yeah, I did a um, I did an amazing event shoot actually up in um, Eagle Hawk Neck, which I haven't done for a long time, and it's right up my alley to get people. In, people in landscape is one of my strengths, and and it was a beautiful private event, sort of tucked away in the forest above Eagle Hawk Neck, sort of overlooking the Tasman Peninsula and all the cliffs. It was it was sort of pretty stunning, and so I did, did a really a low light stuff. Uh, oh, well. all completely low light like it was what, what did you use, um, lens wise for that i was 85? mainly using the 35 one four sigma and an 85 one four is canon which oh, was one, yeah. absolutely incredible lens and you combine that with the r5 at like eight stops so much stabilization it's like who needs a tripod when it's dark it's yeah. like i got this and i was good pushing the iso up and seeing how far i could i could get it and testing its capacity to it says it can focus a negative six stops light and so far that's proven to be very true so how did you find with the iso performance do you have a sort of ceiling where you're happy to uh, go to i haven't really i pushed us i pushed it under eight thousand, which is reasonably comfortable i mean I, I haven't tried blowing up big prints off it yet uh, and it sort of depends on how much shadow uh, is in that image yeah, what you need to recover so. That's yeah. the, oh, we need to recover where, and how well you've exposed it in the first place. But cool, yeah, super good. I did another even more low light event where I actually photographed um, all these incredible Aboriginal um, Tasmanian Aboriginal artists mm. and, and a Malawi guy and another European guy doing an exhibition and um, you know men's work on on country in Tasmania and, and they've done film work and they had an incredible concert and it was basically completely dark with a tiny light on them. So I was sitting at like 5,000 or 8,000 ISO the whole time and uh, at one four. So a lot of low light practice this week. But uh, anyway, we've, um, I, I'd be much more interested in hearing about Jeff's stories of uh, amazing, <laughs> wild, incredible places than, uh, than, than my little scribblings around. But um, How about you, Jeff? Have you been up to – you, you would have done a few shoots more recently. Well, I've been retired for about four weeks now. So I'm Four just weeks? <laughs> It's not very long. It doesn't look like it looks like about ten years you've been retired, <laughs> running around shooting whatever you want, Jeff. Yeah, so a couple of short forays into the bush, but not much yet. But um, there's a fair bit planned. But, yeah, uh, no doubt. Everything is tidied up at the moment. It's actually fairly involved retiring. Yeah, keeps you busy. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. and playing with a new camera, of course, which I'm. Yeah. So you um, recently switched over to the Z six two, is it? Z seven. Seven two, yeah. Seven two. Get them confused all the time. Yeah, and um, yeah. So far, I'm very, very impressed. It's uh, really, really doing well. It's a big step up from the D810 I had before. Yeah, and um, you, you must also find it a bit easier in terms of walking with it and getting because it because of the smaller profile and a bit less weight there. Yeah, that that was a big part of the reason. Um, you might might have noticed I'm getting a bit older. <laughs> it happens to all <laughs> of us. Don't apparently. act like it, mate. <laughs> And, um, yeah, so getting the weight down is becoming a bit of a priority. Um, but, you know, I bought four lenses at the same time. So I, I was going to say, did you change to the native lenses for the Z7? That, that'll bring the weight down too. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a, um, a 20.18, a 85.18, the 14.30 and the 24.70 F4. So oh, they're yeah, all pretty right. light. They're not bad. Yeah, and I think the other thing people don't, they, they talk about the weight, but it, the, the mirrorless is generally much more compact as well. And that, that yeah. makes a massive difference too when you're sort of packing it away in your camera bag and that kind of thing. So I yeah, yeah. don't hear so much about that, but I think that's just as much of a benefit. Um, unfortunately, it probably means you can just squeeze even more camera gear in there, but um, <laughs> it is nice to be able to do that. So, yeah. Jeff, what was the lens you were commenting the other day online about how sharp it was? Um, both the 14 and 30 and the 2470 zooms are really, really good through their range. Yeah, um, right. yeah. yeah the, the one I took of the sunset off in the distance that was that was the 8518, which is exceptional. And I, I didn't get a chance to try the 20 up there, I tried it last night outside, and um, it was pretty good on the stars. Mm, that would be a really yeah. good one for Aurora and stuff like that, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you let go of your D810 and all those lenses, or you still got? Still got two teams. Three days. It sold really All quick. Right. And wow. the, the hundred Zeiss, there was probably ten people wanted that. Wow. Um, the twenty one Zeiss is still sitting in my room. So if any of you fellas want a Zeiss, <laughs> well, it's man. not heavy yeah. at all. Oh, they're beautiful lenses, though. Where, they're, they're very well regarded as a landscape lens. Where, so, do, you, yeah. where do you sell your gear? Um, 
gum tree actually. It's just gum tree, yeah. You've just got to be so careful because mm. I remember when Nick was selling his D eight hundred, um, he got all these There's uh, a lot of scammers inquiries and but one guy rang up from down Bell Reef and he took the the D eight ten and the two Sigma one fours. That was pretty handy. Yeah. And a guy in Brisbane bought the hundred size and that was he wanted to do it through PayPal, and I know you can be scammed through PayPal. Um, and we ended up doing a face to face online video so we could see each other. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I said, I'm sorry, but I still need the money in my account before I send the lens to you. So he did that, and we're all happy. It's yeah. a pretty good policy, that one, definitely. Yeah, well, so, yeah for yeah, sure. It's the only way to do it. I, I remember the last time I sold a lens on eBay, which was a long time ago now. But, um, they took a huge percentage, and then PayPal took a percentage on top of that, and it, it, yeah. knocked, it knocked nearly a hundred dollars or even more, I think, of oh, yeah. the, the price oh, that, that I was selling the lens for. Yeah. yeah, if you if sometimes pay, eBay does deals where it, it sort of does free listing, it's well worth sort of just waiting for those and then just selling everything at that time because otherwise, yeah, well, Gumtree is a good sort of, and Facebook can be really good too. Actually, that's probably a yeah. good first line, and if you have no yeah. luck with the freer yeah. ones, then yeah, eBay does generally sell. Um, so, but yeah, yeah, you do take a big hit sometimes. Yeah, mm. yeah, that that face to face um, video is a good idea, Jeff. As you said, there, there's so many scammers out there, and they'll try yeah. all sorts of stuff. Um, I've I've seen many scams that um, that have gone through, and and it's usually on things that people desire. So you, you see a lot of it with um, phones, uh, probably. Car, um, yeah, exotic lenses um, with um, car parts for older classic cars. Yeah. That's one that um, pulls a lot of people. Um, puppies, that's a pretty well publicized one where yeah, people yeah. sell puppies that don't exist. Oh, um, yeah, basically, you know, they put these beautiful breeds on that, that people um, uh, want and um, they just don't have them and the people pay. You know, two or three grand for a puppy that never arrives. Yeah, and, it is. Uh, yeah, but they're pretty sophisticated to set up, so you have to be you have to be really careful how you deal with it. And um, yeah, some of the tips of you know the face to face video, um, getting them to take a picture with a specific um, handwritten note next to it. Like, so you might say, "Can you put my name and your name handwritten in blue pen next to the item with the serial number showing?" Yeah. Take a picture of it, and and that um, that that will um, and and do it within ten minutes, um, mm. and that that um, certainly weeds out those that don't have the item. Um, if you're trying to buy something, um, and and if you're selling something, then be prepared to meet these people's you know genuine buyers' wishes for you know proof that you actually do have the item. And I generally think too, just as normal advice, if you are going to buy a lens or camera side unseen, um, it's, it's, you, you're taking a pretty big risk there, especially with the, if they're worth a lot of money. And it's generally good to try and stick with local um, sellers that you can actually go around and or meet somewhere and actually see the item before you buy it. Because um, yeah, you just don't know always what exactly what you're getting and you don't want to be ending up with a lemon or something like that. So yeah, you can um, usually, you want... usually tell who who's a photographer and who's not a photographer. Um, and if you're buying off someone that doesn't sound like a photographer and doesn't say the right things, it's a pretty big red flag. And sometimes I'll say stupid things like, oh, my uncle died and I'm selling his camera gear and stuff like that. And look, that might be true if it's something from the 1970s. <coughs> but um, mm. uh, generally, if, if you ask questions that are camera-related and they don't answer them uh, in a camera-related fashion, um, then um, it's a bit of a red flag. So just watch that. Mm, exactly but we digress um yeah i was um, gonna say i was gonna ask <laughs> nick, nick to maybe nick can you maybe give us a bit of a broader background on jeff um we sort of take lukey and nick and i have sort of taken turns about about inviting guests and organizing different nights and uh and nick was only reached out to jeff and and they've known each other for a long time and and i yeah i feel like uh, it'd be nice to give um jeff a bit of a broader introduction before we let him take the take this driving seat yeah thanks paul um uh, well, Jeff, Jeff will be able to introduce himself very well, I'm sure. But um, um, Jeff's a fantastic um, Tasmanian landscape photographer. He's been around for a long time. Um, he's migrated, I believe, through you know the film days into digital and uh, large format. I think Jeff uh, or medium format. Medium format with the view camera. Yeah, yep. Robert Decker's old horseman, actually. Yeah, right. Yeah. Very nice to use. 
Excellent. Uh, and the um, and you, you're a, um, a well-travelled gentleman, and certainly someone who likes to adventure, and um, and particularly as we're talking about tonight um, by sea kite. And in fact, you're so well regarded. Um, you're actually sponsored by an outdoor clothing company or gear company, sorry, um, Mont, <laughs> um, which is, you know, that's, I mean, I, I guess in the days of, of influences and all that sort of thing, um, um, it, it doesn't come as a surprise, but I think that's an arrangement you've had since, you know, a fair way before the uh, the rise of the influence of you. 2005. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a long time. And that's, yeah. and that's based on your imagery and your adventures, you know, into the outdoors, I suppose. It's just amazing because I think I think there's 13 ambassadors, and when I sit down and look at who's in that lineup, I think, oh, how am I there? You know, because some pretty impressive people. You know, like, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's quite an honour, but they're very, very good to work with. They're fantastic people. And they're based in Canberra, aren't they? No, like uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's always good to sp support Australian businesses. So oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah and, fantastic. And the gear is second to none. I mean, I, mm. I have a little bit of Mont gear. I don't have all Mont gear, but I've got a, a couple of items. And um, and gee, I tell you what, fantastic. You know, um, good stuff. Yes. well designed, um, yeah. well researched, and they use good materials too. Yeah. You know, I've noticed, yeah, really good yeah. ones. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I've been my go-to for years for wet weather gear. All my most of my jackets and overpants and my current sleeping bag and a lot of and my hats that I wear. That yeah, they just just all round. They're just top notch, yeah. and they're not crazy overpriced either. No, no, and it's very good backup too. Like if you do have a problem, um, they're not going to sort of brush you off and say go away. They'll they'll fix it without a problem. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. No, they're very, very good with their customer service. But let's not talk so much about Mont, and we'll talk a bit more about uh, about you. So maybe just um, you give us an overview of you, Jeff, and um, and how you got into photography and where it's led you so far. Okay, so um, I guess the first seed was sown a long, long time ago because my dad was a, a wedding photographer for many years, and I spent quite a lot of time in the dark room helping him process images, um, mostly black and white. But uh, and then, probably 45 years ago, I started bushwalking quite a lot. And I think most of us start bushwalking and take a few photos on the way. And then it switches around. Um, so I've been taking photos for, well, I started walking probably about 82, I suppose. Um, and progress, <laughs> I started off with the, the dear old Pentax K1000, which many, many people did. Great camera. Yeah, yes, using print film. Um, and after a while, I, I, graduated to a, a Nikon film camera. I think it might have been an F90, I'm forgetting now. But um, I was using print film and I, one day I bought a roll of Kodachrome 25 and put that through. And when I got the results back, I thought, ah, oh, that's what I've been looking for, you know, because you know how the, the reds really pop out on Kodachrome 25. Yeah. And really, really nice colours. And uh, so I was slide film from then on. Spent a couple of years um, using 35mm slide. And when the time seemed right, Swapped over to digital, which is a Nikon D300, um, and then after that, there was uh, in the past there there was two Mamiya Sevens. I sold the first one and realised what a stupid move that was, so I bought another one because um, it was just a perfect landscape camera. Yeah. And then I bought Rob Laker's uh, Horseman six by nine view camera. Took my black hooded cloth and left the gunpowder at home, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was. A beautiful piece of gear to use, heavy as a brick, you know, like I carried it through the Western Arts as the first time, and I think the pack was 32 kilos. Um, oh. But uh, just a delight to use, a bit akin to um, comparing smoking a tailor-made cigarette, I'm not only smoking now, but smoking a tailor-made cigarette compared to smoking a roll of your own. Just a nice process, you know. Yeah, but anyway, so um, got out of that and got into digital with the D810 which was a nice camera, and now it's digital with the Nikon Z72 again, which is nicer. How did you so find the transition to digital, Jeff? It takes a little while. Every time you change formats or, or mediums, it takes a little while to settle in, but not very long, really. Um, the digital is a funny thing. Digital killed photography, commercial photography in many ways, certainly stock photography, um, because prior to that, 
a good photographer had to, took a photograph and he had to preconceive what the end result was going to be and he had to understand how the film was going to react to light. And he also only had, with Velvia, so you only had five stops to play with, whereas now you've got 12, 13, 14 stops of dynamic range. So you had to be pretty close to the mark and um, you didn't machine gun photograph like a lot of people do now. You know? um, and and it's, I was just thinking when Paul made that comment earlier on about um, I don't need a tripod anymore. I think a tripod is still a good thing because it slows you down. Dave. And makes you think about what you're doing a lot more. I know, I know you weren't serious, but yeah, just having a go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite a Will Patino convert yet, but yeah. <laughs> it's handy if you get it to be able to shoot a two second shot by hand. It's pretty amazing. Mm. Yeah. But you were doing more run and gun too, weren't you, Paul? Like in terms of that oh, event stuff. Yeah. Completely run and gun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, cameras now, I mean, we, we're spoiled, right? Then, as one reviewer said recently on YouTube, you know, how, how spoiled should we be? I mean, it's it's getting very, very easy, and software is making it easy to be totally fake and false as well. So um, it's a bit, of a bit of a problem the way things are going in some ways. So but how did you get into the, um, like, it's one thing to go bushwalking in Tassie and take pictures, and it's another thing to, like, jump in a kayak and go around Antarctica or Greenland and things like that. Um, yeah, 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 a little bit of madness helps, I suppose. Um, <laughs> compared to some of the people in Tassie, I mean, certainly uh, I watched Grant's um, uh, go on this program a little while ago and, and other people that live in Tassie like Eric Phillips and, and quite a few others, um, they've done a heap more than me. But um, my first expedition was in a sea kayak. I was 55 and I thought, no, I wouldn't mind going for a bit of a paddle. So I organised with um, a few other club members in the club I was in to go across to across the mainland and come back to Hardway, um, paddle across the <laughs> right. And that was the first expedition. That was in 2011. Very, very satisfying. Um, pretty amazing at times. Uh, you know, like um, there's one crossing there, it's 55 kilometres, and when you're in the middle, you look 360 degrees and you can just see 360 degrees of water. So yeah. the weather's fairly reasonable. Yeah. It just took you five hours to get there. Yeah. Um, and so that was, yeah, 2011. Then so you leap pro Sorry, Jeff, do you leap pro frog across all the, like the Kent group yeah, yeah, and, you know, and so the Fernos and, yeah. Oh, that's... Come, come that's down here to Tide. Um, you, you set off from Port Welsh Pool, paddle down to the bottom end of Wilson's Prom. And then hop across to Hogan Island, which is 55 kilometres, and then another 46 kilometres to the Kent Group, and then the big step, which is 62 kilometres down to Killer Cranky, oh. um, and then work your way down the, the west coast of Flinders. And the last bit is potentially the most dangerous part, which is across Banks Strait. Yeah. Coming down to Tassie. Currents down there are insane. Yeah. It cuts up like a, a washing machine at times, so you've got yeah. to pick it um, so, Yeah, so that was the first one. And, Fantastic. Um, I'd wanted to go to Greenland for quite a long time and a few years, well, a few years before that, I, I looked at the idea and it was just logistically very difficult. It was a hard place to get to and it's an even harder place to travel around because there's no roads between the townships. Um, but then I heard about a guy in, based in the Shetland Islands that took commercial guided expeditions, if you like, in, in East Greenland. And I contacted him and it sounded pretty pretty damn good actually so um in 2012 um another mate myself from tassie he was actually on the best trail crossing with me we flew across to iceland spent a bit of time in iceland which in itself is quite an impressive place mm. i think you've been there luke yeah definitely it's bit, amazing yeah. a bit spoilt there now like the we first time we went there was 2012 and it was it was pretty good it wasn't a lot of tourists we drove around iceland um and then flew across to Greenland and met up with the others and um, went for paddle. And fortunately, Martin, Martin Rickard, the fellow that runs these trips, he's, he tailors the trip to suit the um, abilities of the group. So we had a, a strong group. And for that reason, he suggested um, there's an island where he starts out from called, called Amasalik Island. And he suggested we might try and circumnavigate the island. And uh, that was about it. 150, 100, yeah, 140, 150 kilometres around the island and then uh, go for a bit of wander further north. So that's what we did. Cool. And that was the first first trip. Um, while I was on that trip, in the middle of that trip, 
Um, at one stage there, I said to Martin, do you mind if I paddle back out and photograph a particular iceberg a couple of kilometres away? And he said, yes. And while I was out there, I thought, oh, I, could, I could do this one myself, you know. It'd be nice to come back and go for a paddle by myself. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's some limitations to that and, and downsides, you know. Anyway, I got back home and sent him an email and said, you know, would you buy me a kayak and a spray deck and a shotgun, please? And uh, he said yes, which was surprising because his reputation was on the line if I got, um, if I came out to take. Yeah. Anyway, so 2013, I was back there again for a, a solo trip, which was going to be a tent-based trip. Um, in the months leading up to it, I heard about eight polar bears that had been seen in the area. They're not supposed to be there in summer, but they were that year. Um, and I flew into the nearest island that had the airport, Kulisuk, and on the boat trip across to the main island of um, uh the boatman said, oh, you know, there was a, another bear up at Tasselak Fjord last week, and I thought, well, it's just turned into a hut-based trip. <laughs> 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 the idea of staying in a tent in bear country by myself was, you know, sort of had its limitations. Yeah, pass. <laughs> Yeah, and then there's no trees to hang anything up in either. I guess there so, are no trees. No yeah. trees in ninety five percent of Greenland. There's one small forest down the south, but the rest of it, there's not even any bushes in there. Um, and then uh, in two thousand sixteen, the, the same guy that led that first trip, um, he was organising a private expedition to work our way up the east coast of Greenland to a, a nineteen thirty two um, base camp. And he invited me to come along on that, so I went back there again. So Greenland's a funny place. Once once you visit once, you will return. It, it's just such a special place, stunning place. And then um, to continue the story, to, when I was doing that trip up to the base camp on the third trip, um, I'll give more information about it later, but <clears throat> there's a fellow in New Zealand called Paul Caffin, who's the greatest long-distance paddler that's ever lived. He, paddled, he was the first one to paddle around Australia in more than a weekend. Um, paddled around the South and North Islands and New Zealand and Japan and Alaska and, you know, you name it, he's, he's done it pretty well. So he was organising a trip down to the Antarctic Peninsula to, to paddle down there. He's a, a polar tragic. He's, he'd been to this base camp that we were attempting to get to, one of the very few people that had been. Um, and there was a, a common thread um, this particular base camp was uh, set up by a fellow called Gino Watkins in 1932, and he'd been commissioned by Pan American Airlines to investigate um, the possibility of a transatlantic air route from Winnipeg to the UK, I think. Um, so they needed meteorological information and, and uh, you know, information about the landscape and what have you. So. They went there in 32, about three or four days into the trip. It was supposed to be several months they were going to be there. Three or four days into the trip, Gino went seal hunting in his kayak by himself and came unstuck and didn't come back. So um, they never found his body, found his clothes Ooh. in his kayak. And his second in command was a fellow called John Rymel, who's a South Australian guy. And he took over and they completed that um, expedition survey. And then in... Uh, 1934 to 37, Rymer went down to the Antarctic Peninsula to Graham Land and he set up two base camps down there. So Paul knew I'd been, I, I did get there, I got to um, Juno Watkins Base Camp in Greenland, which was effectively John Rymer's base camp. Um, and uh, so he invited me on the trip to Antarctica to, to go for a bit of a paddle in Antarctica as well. So that was the story behind that. So that's what led me to all these different places seems to be a bit of a common thread of being cold <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well we might as well start seeing some yeah. um, some details and images you're going to start yeah. with and, uh, Jeff? yep okay so I'll, I'll share my screen now yeah go for it with a bit of luck you'll get that yeah, okay. yep all there yeah, good. Okay. So this is obviously Greenland and the red circle marks the area that I've been paddling in. Um, it's a it's a very isolated area. That whole coastline is around about two and a half thousand kilometres long and there's three and a half thousand people live there. Now, can you see my cursor? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. So there's five 
um, communities down here. The biggest one is Tazilek, which has got 2,000 people. Um, and there's another community up here, Itacortima. Um, so there's not a lot going on when you go to East Greenland. West Greenland's got a lot more towns. Um, it's a lot more Europeanised, heavily Danish influenced, whereas uh, the East Greenland people are still basic, pretty basic Inuit, um, undeveloped. Uh, there's a lot of um, unemployment there. There's probably 80% unemployment. A lot of alcoholism, a lot of suicide, unfortunately. Um, the, the, the land, the, the surroundings of the towns can be really squalid and dirty, but the people are beautiful. So you've got to go across there with the right attitude in mind. It's a yeah. fabulous place. Just take my word for that. So, how did um, you, um, how did you get actually there? get there to start with, Jeff? Do you um, fly? So, you flew from Iceland. Yeah, to get to East Greenland, you, you've got to go from Iceland. You can't yep. get there from anywhere else from Reykjavik, um, domestic airport. So to fly from Hobart to Reykjavik is on average, because I've been there four or five times, on average about 42 hours. Mm, it's a decent um, leg. Well, <laughs> it is. You, you arrive in Reykjavik invariably at midnight and then it's an hour's bus ride into, well, you arrive at the airport at midnight and then it's an hour's bus drive into the Reykjavik township. Yeah. So you have to sleep after that. So then it's, it's a couple of hours flight across to... Um, Kulisuk, which is this little island down here, and then 40 minutes boat ride across the Tassie Lake, which is hiding behind the red. It's T A S W I L A K Q. So the red line was our first trip around Amasalik Island, and then um, we followed it up to this glacier up here, Corral Glacier, made our way back down to Tassie Lake. It's about 12, 14 days, about 300 kilometres. Um, and it was just the best trip. You know, it was, it was a fantastic taste of Greenland. Mm. It's the sort of place um, when you look at drawings of mountains by little kids and it's just super, super pointy, sharp peaks. It's a bit like that wherever you look. Lots of ice, lots of snow. It's all what, fjords, what time then? of year are you aiming for? What season to be able to... Um, well, it opens really the, the being able to move around because the ice breaks up um, end of July, more reliably, early, uh, end of June, sorry, more reliably early July. Um, but that's when the flies are really, really bad too. There's most Arctic areas in the summer can be pretty um, heavily infested with flies and mosquitoes. The second time I went there was August and I left there um, probably this 10th of September, I think, and it was the snow was just starting to get down to sea level, but there were no flies, so <laughs> it was a better time. Yeah. And uh, the third trip, I think that was in um, that was July as well. Yeah, so you've got a pretty narrow window. You can say two yeah. to three months maximum. A bit like Antarctica, really. Um, the difference with Greenland over Antarctica is well, I, I prefer Greenland. Greenland's when you get away from those little communities, Greenland is really, really remote. Um, the Antarctic Peninsula is certainly the part of it that we visited. And obviously, there's parts of Antarctica that are fantastically remote. But the parts that we visited is visited by about 30,000 people in a two to three month window. Right. So um, it's pretty busy. You don't, you don't not see people, let's put it that way. This, um, the blue line on this map from, from here, up to our furthest point north, which is 100 odd kilometres up, and on, on the way back, we saw one runabout on that whole trip. That was it. Yeah, uh, we didn't see yachts, we didn't see cruise boats, we didn't see zodiac zipping about. So um, yeah, so it was uh, pretty isolated, pretty isolated. So this uh, look at that. This is Tesselak. This is the main town, which is like it's got about 2,000 people. It's also the only place on the east coast, I think, it's certainly in that area that's got cars and sealed roads. Um, and uh, the bay in the background is called Kong Oscar Haven. Um, so you turn up here and you, you're just surrounded by mountains and um, that's looking across the bay at sunset. Pretty good to start, you know. Yeah. And uh, you just start packing all the gear up and, and check out the kayaks that you've been supplied with, which fortunately in Martin's case are top-notch. Um, Welsh kayaks, and you put your head net on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
when I arrived, or before I arrived, I, I did read it said uh, take two head nets because if you lose one, if you only take one, you lose it, you're going to be really unhappy. So I had my head nets and I walked into town from the camp and I noticed that all the inhabitants around, I've, I'd already swallowed three flies, I, I noticed that all the inhabitants around were all wearing head nets as well and I thought, well, if they can, I can too. <laughs> so um, just to give you an idea of, of what uh, it's like, um, no, you're not going to see that, are you? Hang yeah, on. no, it's up. Okay. It's up. It's it? oh, oh, it was. I um, just need to go back to that window. Yep. Okay, you got that? Yep. yep. Right. Oh, look at them. That's given an indication of what the flowers can be like. Are they biting flowers? Uh, no, oh, it's a mixture. In, in, at night time, they get replaced by mosquitoes and they do bite. Yeah, so, um, oh, fun. It, it's wow. tough, you know, you, you never go without a good feed, that's one thing, I suppose, but yeah, I could do without them. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll get back to this and away we go. So, um, uh, on the right hand side, you can just see three tents. That's the, the camp area, which is about a kilometre out of where the main towns are. Is and that an airplane in the air there? Or is it? What's that? I'm trying to think what that is, a wreck of it is in the upper left. Yeah, it's an old, old boat. Oh, okay. it looks like a cheese large. Is that like wild cotton in the foreground? It's yeah. Arctic cotton. Yep. Um, yeah, oh. beautiful, beautiful plant. Very, very photogenic. Just sort mm. of be white and pure and moves nicely in the wind. A couple of old wreck, wreck boats in the background. Yeah, it's a magic and show. And then um, we headed off and we paddled around the bottom of, of a, a mastic island to this deserted settlement called Ikatek, which had been cleared out about 15, 20 years previous um, just I'm not too sure why they left there some fishermen still come around and stay there when they, they're fishing or hunting but uh, we had the place to ourselves so we camped there and that's also set at the mouth of the Cernalik Fjord now, Cernalik Fjord is a very impressive place it's um, the mouth is probably eight or ten kilometers wide it's 75 kilometers straight up and then does a dog leg for another 15, 20 kilometres and ends up at the Helheim Glacier, which is one of the fastest moving glaciers in Greenland. Moves, um, oh, what was it, 20, 25 metres a year, I think it was. But they had a, a massive carving event a few years ago. It was spread all over the, the TV and um, just, I think it was an area the size of, of Staten Island um, let go in one, one foul swoop. And... Uh, wow. Huge, huge. Anyway, so this was the start of that um, fjord. And then for the next two and a half days, we paddled up through the fjord. Um, we mentioned before there's no trees in Greenland. There's also no soil. So when you die, you just get buried under a pile of rocks. So <laughs> those are about. Um, occasionally you'll see a pile of rocks with a, a skull peeking out. Um, this is a, a abandoned, fairly old Inuit winter quarters. Um, somewhat cosy you would imagine it, it stretched skins over the top and and quite a few people inside to keep the warmth and, and a, a tunnel below the level of the floor to um so they keep the heat in so uh, you see yeah, that there's yeah. quite a lot of man. settlement areas dotted around wherever there's water available you'll find some sort of settlement yeah. um so we we paddle up through the the Cernalic fjord and it's just like this over and over and over again it's just beautiful, you know, multiple shapes, big icebergs. Um, it's tidal, so these icebergs are generally moving about quite a lot, so you've got to be really careful. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, places there, we, we couldn't get past them, so we'd have to land and portage the kayaks around the outside. Of the, the Jeff, how, how common is it to get conditions that still? Um, at that time of year, pretty common. Um, I was going to say that this, this particular area, the Masonic area of East Greenland, um, suffers pitterack winds in winter. Um, these are katabatic winds that come down from the ice cap under certain conditions. And in uh, was it the 6th of February 1970, Tasselak was hit by a, a pitterack that effectively blew the town away. The wind instruments left at 325 kilometres an hour. Oh. So, yeah. I mean, even only three or four years ago, I got some videos sent to me of a um, 40-foot 
sea container being blown down the street. Um, luckily, wow. that's in winter. Um, in summer, it's generally calm and really quite pleasant. Yeah, so not too bad. And how do you find um, taking pictures while you're on the water like that? Do you have like enough time to sort of put the paddle up and, and click away and there's no major dramas? Yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, I, I've used a variety of cameras. The first one I used on Bass Strait was a Canon PowerShot D10, I think. Um, you just keep it around your neck or, or in a deck bag. Um, for Greenland, I think I was using a Panasonic FT3, and in Antarctica, I took a pair of Nikon AW1s down with me. So waterproof cameras, so you're limited in quality and resolution, but it gets the point across, you know. Mm, uh, definitely. So this this shot is an iceberg that's just rolled. Um, we were just paddling along, minding our own business. We we're about to paddle past this, and we noticed that the the side um, facing towards us was starting to lift. So. Um, <laughs> Like a whole two, three-story building just flipping over, isn't it? Oh, come on. be uh, underneath that one when it was lifted up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, I don't know. Okay. Now, we'll get back to Lightroom here. Okay. And there we go. So, that was just a small iceberg. I mean, icebergs get much, much bigger than that. You know, we, on the, on the third trip in Greenland, we were <laughs> paddling along in, in thick fog. And we heard this thing in the distance roll and it just seemed to be making a noise for about five minutes. It was just the most incredible noise going on. And we just thought, well, we're glad we're not there, you know. Yeah, so we carried on and we worked our way up this coastline beside the um, beside the, the icebergs, bearing in mind, like I said, that this is tidal. So all these icebergs are all going in different directions and bumping into each other and occasionally falling over. So you've just got to be on on your toes and um but at other times they're beautiful you know you get these yeah. beautiful sculptural shapes um this was late evening probably 10 o'clock at night must That's have had so many time. pinch me moments during oh, that time yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's pretty good you know this was taken at midnight um <laughs> i'll admit to being um a little under the weather because they sell whiskey in 500 mil plastic bottles at break of the airport ten dollars for Half a litre. <laughs> <laughs> a litre? Oh, my God. Yeah, they don't have the same sort of tax system we do, that's for sure. No, 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 alcohol. No. Perfect for travelling, carrying in a kayak. And then um, after two and a half days, we reached this little township, another one with about 240 people, town of Tinitekalak, or Tinit for short. Yeah. And uh, very quaint, um, not a whole lot of garden going on, not a lot of soil, no trees, no bushes. Um, mm. We camp near here. And watch the mm. sunset. Oh, so, wow. uh, pretty good. I mean, this this is this is typical. You know, it's, it's the thing. Um, so our, our route the next day was up through this gap through here and and away. Um, next morning, like that, and uh, mm. fairly cool. I mean, Greenland in winter, you can expect up to about 12, 11 to twelve degrees during the day. Sometimes maybe down to minus two, minus three. Not cold. Oh, 11 to 12. Wow. That's surprising. Yeah. yeah. Um, it may, you know, typically probably only four or five, but yeah. not, not a very cold. The water's very cold. Yeah. Um, and at, at one stage on the, on the third trip, we were paddling up towards the glacier and the mate paddling beside me said, this is like paddling in an ice box. box. And he was, he was pretty right. You know, it was, it was yeah. a cold day. But, um, Jeff, yeah. um, we just had a question on YouTube um, about from Andrew about what the comms were like. Did you have any mobile coverage or just use sat phones and that sort of thing? Yeah, no. Um, very limited mobile coverage. I, I normally take a satellite messenger. Um, I didn't have it for this trip. The only communication we had for this trip was a, a spot tracker, um, which was un spots are very unreliable in high latitudes, north and south. Um, and as a result, <laughs> my wife got a bit of a panic because she didn't hear from us for about two or three days, but um, eventually yeah. the signal came through. So limited communications on that first trip. Yeah, yeah. so 
you, you take the weather as it comes um, and you don't talk to anybody outside. Yeah. So this what's, is what's the temperature at night? Uh, yeah. Not much below freezing. Um, often around freezing temperature. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good compared to winter when it's you know minus thirty, minus forty. Mm. Um, water temperature is only about one and a half, two degrees. So oh, that's quite cold. a problem for your hands. <clears throat> Yeah. And then, um, yeah. oh, wow. headed, headed further north, um, up past it's like a trigger there. plant, yeah. That's, um, I forgot the name of it, but it's uh, Greenland's um, national flower, um, pretty attractive flowers and, and not a nice spot. This is a, a fjord north of a settlement called Kumiat, and very, very shallow fjord in one place. You've, you've actually, even, even with a kayak, you've got to wait for high tide to get through. So, we we battled our way through and set up camp here. And this was a scene of an interesting event on the third trip. Um, so we, we stayed here for another night then continued carrying on north. Um, very, very few sandy beaches. This is one of the few ones. Black Beach makes the icebergs stand out quite nicely. Mm -hmm. And uh, continued up to the Corral Glacier, which is behind me. Wow. Um, uh, the, the amazing oh, thing up oh, there... Sure. I took this photo standing on a, a little rocky knoll, probably three or four metres high. And I, in turning around 360 degrees, I could count around about 40 glaciers, including <laughs> hanging glaciers. And yes. wow. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And see why you went back. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So that was our, our furthest point. So we turned around and started heading south. And one morning, uh, got up as the mist cleared because it was really misty. Um, yeah. These popped out of the mist. I, I love this shot, Jeff. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I was pretty pleased with that. Yeah, I, this is the one we chose to represent the show. It just for all of us, it just struck a chord. Yeah, yeah. this was taken with a Nikon D seven thousand from memory, so uh, a little APS-C. Yeah, yeah, great cameras. Um, and then we then we got back down to Tesla. That's uh, looking across Conlosca Haven again. So it's mm -hmm. quite common to get levels of mist in the morning. Yes, yeah, it's not unusual at all. Yeah, yeah okay. It's, it's yeah. a very calm place in summer, not in winter. So one of the old hulks down on the on the shore. So many photographic subjects. It's amazing. Yeah, well, that, that one's a bit hard now. It's been burnt, but anyway, it's oh. life. And, and the, the dogs, the, the huskies are all purebred in England, in Greenland. <clears throat> they don't allow other breeds in. And they are all friendly and they're beautiful dogs. Mm. They spend the summer chained up. Um, just waiting for the time to pull the sled. Yeah. So then, um, like I said, I decided I could do a, a solo trip. So I flew back into Greenland the following year. And the plan this time was to start my paddling trip from further north. So I uh, loaded the kayak up, put it on this um, local community freighter that serviced all the communities and headed 50 or 60 kilometres north up to Kumiat, and um, no cars, no trucks, only front end loaders. So <laughs> to move the kayak around to where I could start, that was uh, onto the forks and away we went. So was that the sort of thing, um, sort of logistics you were doing on the fly, like you know, getting this front end loader to move your kayak? Yeah, you do, and it's it's really fun because nobody speaks English. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, there was one guy in this community. There was a, a Danish school teacher and I'd been communicating with him and he was pretty helpful. Yeah. Um, and he, he'd, uh, he had his own website and there was a particular photo on that website that I wanted to go to that place. So I did later on. Um, and so you would have had to have then bought all your food in Iceland then or something and um, flow, yeah, flow yeah. over with it? That, that was funny. The, the first trip we bought our food in a supermarket in Iceland and we had no idea what we were buying. It was, it was all written in Icelandic. Um, this trip I organised for a guy that supplied ex expedition food to meet me at Heathrow. <coughs> and um, he had, I think he had a two-hour train trip to get to me, actually. And, and, yeah, that was good food for this trip. Yeah. Um, the third trip, I think I took stride meals with me. So oh, Okay. Um, yeah. Hey, Tazzy. Yeah, yeah, so for those that haven't heard, Strive meals are dehydrated 
um, meals that um, they've made here in Hobart, I think, and um, yeah. uh, very, very tasty. Um, a lot of bushwalkers and expeditioners use them because they're lightweight and you can just chuck some boiling water, just um, water yeah. in, in yeah. water and they uh, rehydrate and make a, a very nice meal that um, is suddenly a lot heavier than it was when it was packed. So Definitely a lot better than the freeze-dried stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah strike, strike tends to be very palatable and quite uh, uh, convincing as food compared to something else. <laughs> That's what you want really too, isn't it, when you eat food? You want... <laughs> and fortunately, my wife's um, dried food is about three times better than Strive. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that sounds lovely. Yeah, she's pretty good. So anyway, I, I left Kilmiot and paddled back up through this very, very shallow fjord again up to um, appropriately named the Blue Hut with the Blue Toilet which is just perched over the rocks and the tide does the clean up every day. What a crazy <laughs> place for a hut. Oh, it's, it's, it's awesome, you know. So um, I, I lobbed into here and uh, I knew the forecast for the next day was pretty ordinary, so I intended to stay there a couple of days. And it's just this oh, constant shit. procession of icebergs drifting past. Yeah. Um, the odd odd person walking out. <laughs> the old, mon the old mon icicle. I've had a few of those. I haven't yeah, got a yeah. jacket but, yet. Wherever I went, I had the gun with me. Um, that had solid slugs and a 12 gauge mm. um, because the thought of being caught away from um, somewhere to shelter and running into something on four legs was not, not appealing. <laughs> mm. um, but every, everyone carries guns in Arctic places like that, though, Jeff. It's not unusual, is it? No, that's right. I mean, in, in, in Svalbard, it's, it's illegal to leave the towns without a gun. <laughs> um, they've, they've got a lot more bears there. The likelihood of running into a bear here is relatively slim, but it's still there. You know, the, yeah. the Inuit shoot about 25 bear in this area each winter. Um, mm. But like I said, there had been eight bears seen in the area um, fairly recently. So the, the gun was a, a cause for a problem for me. Though. The next day I went for a walk and that gun carried best upside down and had a sighting rib along the top of the barrel. And um, I was walking along and I, I was walking across some very highly polished rock and slipped over and my hand landed on the rock first and the siding rib on the gun landed on my finger. Oh, no. I popped it wide open. And I looked at it and thought, oh, that's really going to hurt soon, you know, and I thought, second thing, I thought, well, that's going to make a really good photograph, <laughs> which I haven't got here because it was pretty good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> but uh, then I, I got some strong painkillers into me and thought, well, I better go back tomorrow and get that fixed up. So um, I organised doing that. So this was my sleeping arrangement. This was the only time that the, the shotgun actually had a cartridge in the chamber when I was sleeping. Um, I had an alarm set up outside the door of the hut as well. And uh, just look out the window and watch what's going past. Mm. Mm. So they're huts are for public use, and obviously, or did you have to yeah. arrange yeah, they, they're built mostly by the Inuit for fishing. Um, yeah. Some are pretty ordinary and some are quite nice. That one is really nice. Mm. Um, some a couple you'll see later on are <laughs> quite different. <laughs> um, so the next morning, because it was low tide and I couldn't get through that fjord, I thought I'll go for a paddle up north a little bit um, and then go back down to Kumiat to get the finger sorted out in the afternoon. So um, just to give an indication, everything in Greenland is big. That little that red arrow points to the blue hut. Oh, wow. You can see what the conditions like. Beautifully flat, calm. And I was paddling north, and I saw this. First of all, I saw a herd of seals off to the left, a big, big bunch of seals. That was fine. And then I saw this black shape in the water in front of me, probably 20, 30 metres away. And I really couldn't work out what it was. And it sort of looked like it was about, I don't know, 100 mils, 120 mils long, whatever, just a black rectangular sort of shape and then it started moving towards me you can see the ripples coming off either side but and I thought well I don't know what it is but I'm not going to stay to find out and so I sprinted away and I thought it, it could have been a bear and a little further north I landed at an old um, ex-American army base called Louis East 2 which was there in the Cold War and there was some people there from a French expedition yacht. And I was talking to the skipper and he said, where are you staying? And I said, oh, the Blue Hut. And um, he said, oh, he said, there were two bears there last week. I said, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I, I um, 
headed back and, and got back to the hut and um, headed off back down to Kubia to get my finger looked at. But traveling by yourself in that environment does your head in. It's very, very challenging mentally because I just found I was thinking about bears all the time. Yeah. But anyway, it's still pretty nice to look at. Just on that, um, Jeff, have you seen the TV series called Alone? Um, not sure. I don't think so. Yeah, it's a it's an awesome awesome series. It's a reality TV series, which might put you off, but um, I just thought I'd mention it because of what you just said. Then, basically, they chuck a whole bunch of people on their own uh, in uh, areas like. Um, um, Canada and, and Arctic areas and Patagonia, basically. There's a whole series of them. And uh, the people have to survive there with only 10 items. They have to get their own food and hunt and fish. And they do all the filming themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you would absolutely love it, I reckon. Uh, it's worthwhile looking up. I think you can probably yeah, see cool. some of it on um, SBS On Demand. So, um, yeah, yeah, you'll enjoy it, I reckon. <laughs> I'll check it out. I'll check yeah, it out. And I reckon the viewers would like it too. If you haven't seen Alone, it really is worth um, checking out. It's uh, as like a, a bit Bear grill style. Yeah. And without the cameraman. Yeah. yeah. Basically. And they have got to deal with getting food, shelter, fire, and the animals and the insects. And we're talking Canada, um, a lot of it. So they've, they've got grizzly bears, black bears. Um, all sorts of uh, wolves and that sort of thing, and uh, it's 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 really quite a hardcore show, and it's, it's worth watching. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, the, the winner is the person that can stay up there the longest. Um, I mean, so what they usually, they flick a PLB or something when they say they're out, kind of thing. And yeah, they've got a satellite phone, and they yeah. ring up the um, ring up the producers who come and get them by helicopter yeah. or boat usually, and. Um, yeah, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Just, just based on what you said then, Jeff, it, it does your head in. These guys are all living by themselves in the wilderness yeah. for, a, you know, two or three months, um, some of the winners. So, uh, it's it's, it's still very um, very satisfying to travel by yourself. I, I really prefer yeah. it. You know. um, so anyway, I got back to Kumut, and while I was back there, I went down to the wharf one evening, and it was only late evening, it was still light in the western sky and I could see a green band in the sky. I thought, oh, I wonder if it is, you know. And this was what it actually looked like to the naked eye. It wasn't just camera. Oh, um, the only problem was I only had a little gorilla pod tripod. <laughs> 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 so I was spending a lot of time lying on the ground trying to get uh, photographs, impossible photographs. <laughs> but, um, you it did it, a it great was, job uh, still. Wow. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't too bad. So then the next day, oh, I... Um, I paddled up to Tassilac Fjord. How did your finger go, by the way? That was all good? Uh, well, it was too late to stitch it, so they just banded it up and said, uh, yeah. go away. Um, <laughs> it was fine. It was okay. It took about a month to heal, and 10 years later, well, not 10 years, five years later, it was still numb. Oh. But um, I went up, I'd seen a photo for this fjord before from that Danish school teacher, and um, I was fortunate enough to get perfect conditions. I, I paddled around the corner and I just thought, well, that's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Mm. You know? um, yeah. And he, he told me there were three really nice huts up here I could stand, stay in. So I paddled up and down this fjord looking for these huts. And, and I, I sent him a, a satellite message. I said, uh, well, that's through an email. I said, where are the huts? And he, he was on the ball. He sent me the grid coordinates and um, the huts are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> This was actually the best one. Um, <laughs> oh, it was it was pretty damn good, actually. I mean, the, the door was only held closed by string, despite what it looked like. Um, so I had the bear alarm on the outside, and but inside it was beautiful. Oh. Really, really cozy. Yeah. I had my fifty seventh birthday here, which was mm. a swig of whiskey and a cherry ripe. And, um, <laughs> nice. that, could, that couldn't have been magic. Better. Wow. And then they said, had, "Oh, that's a bit of fun." Yeah, so that that was that was that trip. That was pretty good. Then um, back to Jeff, Jeff how, going back a sec, how do the bear alarms work? Um, they're made by a guy in, in America called called Pack Alarms, and they're an electronic arm. They've got a spool which holds about thirty or forty meters of strong fishing line, and that's that line is attached to a, a an arm on the, the actual unit unit itself. And when the um, fishing line is disturbed, it makes the arm go over centre. Which flicks a switch and um, sounds a, an audible, quite a loud 
alarm, which you just don't want to hear, you know. Um, is yeah. it also designed to scare the bear away? Is it more just to no, let you know that no, there's just a problem? You know that you're about to be eaten. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, some other places they use bangers um, around, particularly in Svalbard, but that doesn't always work. There was a, a, a school kid who was killed there quite a few years ago, um, dragged out of a tent because the bangers did me off. So, yeah. So, but they're, they're pretty effective. Pretty effective. Um, but the, the, the problem is the alarm goes off, and then you've got to get out of your sleeping bag and out of the tent. And, yeah, come and greet what may. Mm. So this is um, back in Tasselac, this is a typical Inuit house. Um, they're quaint, but they're not terribly well looked after. Um, oh, this was, this was on the serious. third trip to Greenland. Um, my wife came with me this time to see what I was raving about. Now, we, instead of paddling around a Mastic Island, we took a, a powerboat trip around, and this was at Tinnatekalak again on the edge of the Sermonic Fjord. These clouds were racing across the sky and they were moving really quickly and I just got a chance to get one shot with them in the right position. Yeah. And um, like I said, no earth, so they just bury you under the rocks. Um, this is a tinder again. And then um, after we left East Greenland, my wife and myself went across to the West Greenland, had a look around there. She went back to, well, actually we both went back to Iceland and she came home and I flew back to Greenland and met up with these people. The guy in the red jacket is the... Uh, Martin Rickard, he's the guy that organised this third trip. Mm -hmm. And we put five kayaks into that boat and the other four of us into the other boat and we headed 80 kilometres north to the to the start point of our last trip. Um, and we, the first night we camped at a place called The Slabs for fairly obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, very remote um, and it was going to get remoter. So the next morning we hopped into our kayaks and paddled around the corner and paddle up towards these floating mountains and they, they are really, really huge. Really big. Um, they've come all the way down the Greenland coast from way, way up north. Yeah. And um, that first, the first night on that trip, we used the alarms, but this one, it wasn't quite so good, the situation for using the alarms. So we had, I think it was an hour and a half each bear watch. Uh -huh. uh, that's me sitting there in front of our little fire with the shotgun in that bag unzipped. Um, and that's about as dark as it got that night. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't get terribly dark at that time of year. Interestingly, about two weeks later, we had six hours of darkness because it gets dark progressively very, very quickly. Wow. Yeah. So then we kept on paddling north. You can see that iceberg's been upside down, it's well water-worn. Yeah. And um, lobbed in at uh, Depot Islands. There's another... Um, in your winter quarters there, oh, you know, yeah, the yeah. and uh, beautiful location. Next morning, it was very misty and foggy and also very tidal, so these icebergs kept on looming out of the mist towards us. Oh, wow. And that's huge. Yeah. That's really, really big, like um, that length there might be the length of the kayak. <laughs> <laughs> So it makes you keep your eyes Four up. stories, five stories. In yeah, yeah. Um, kept on heading further north. Um, beaches were a bit rocky. And uh, we stopped here to see what that hut was like, but it was putrid. Um, and uh, kept on heading further north. And this particular day, we couldn't find a place to get off the water. Um, we ended up turning around and heading back down to a campsite we saw further south. We ended up about 46 kilometres that day and we're all pretty knackered. Yeah. Saw some nice icebergs in the way and um, ended up camping here. Mm. Oh, wow. It's only, I think, two days from our destination. Nice sunset. And uh, that was my sleeping setup. Nice <laughs> warm Mont sleeping bag, nice warm Mont icicle jacket, and my friend. Mont shotgun, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was really funny because we, we had a, a few false alarms of those alarms, like an Arctic fox would go through one or at one stage there, a glacier, or not, not a glacier, an iceberg um, fell apart on the other side of the fjord and sent a fairly large wave across the fjord which hit the tripwires. And you, you're lying in your sleeping bag, sound asleep, and all of a sudden you hear this beep, 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 you know, you think, oh, okay. So you, you're trying to get the zip undone on the sleeping bag and it catches 10 times on the way down and, trying to get the zip, inner door zip undone and then the tent door and grab the gun and pop out and you don't know if you're going to be looking at a set of teeth or what, you know. It's, um, 
it gets your attention. But, uh, anyway, so we, we reached this campsite at Lake Fjord or Tuktulik, um, and that's the remains of the hut from uh, 84 years previously. Um, so uh, there wasn't a lot there. We, we did find one of their old boats in the mud, which was pretty special. And then we only stayed there one night because we were concerned about the weather because there's one particular spot called Hell, Hell Bluff, which is not a very good place to be if the weather's bad. So we started heading back south again. Um, quite cold this day, um, probably only one or two degrees. And heading back down, this is probably about 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. I was starting to form on the, on the decks of the kayaks. And uh, we were looking for a place to camp, and we found it. Pretty good selfie spot. <laughs> <laughs> is that, that's you there, is it? That's me, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you poser. <laughs> yeah, I am, yeah. I don't very often get into the... No red jacket there, though? Uh, no, no. I don't have, uh, no, I don't have a red jacket. Oh, uh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> one, sorry. So this was like a an iceberg graveyard. They all came here and grounded and hung around. Beautiful, beautiful place. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Goodness, what a pretty, trend contrast. Pretty special place to be. Beautiful. It's got to be unique in the world if it's shot like that. Yeah. It's special. Um, big icebergs. I mean, you can see the paddler on the right hand side there. Um, gives you a bit of an idea of scale. And big, big, big. Everything's big. Yeah. And, and it'll, it'll eat you if you can. It's, um, so, uh, yeah, you just sort of wander down through here and. <laughs> this this particular iceberg, that's a, a mate. We've become really good friends on that trip and he backed up to it and I got the photograph of it and then he took a photograph of me backing up to it and just as I left, a really big piece fell off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then um, this is back in the, in the shallow fjord again and this particular night, we're about 10 kilometres from Kumiut oh. and it was a known Arctic fox area. So we thought, oh, we know we, we're close to civilization now. There's foxes about. We won't put the, the trip wires up. And about two o'clock in the morning, the, um, the leader came across to me and he knocked on the tent and woke me up. He said, oh, he said, a bear just walked past Jim's tent. He was camped right down next to the water and he heard this bear go sloshing past, you know. Luckily, it wasn't hungry. And uh, he said, it's dark. He said, it's gone there. You can't see anything. I said, oh, well, not much point in getting up, I suppose. So rolled over and went back to sleep. Huh. So, um, yeah, so that was that was Greenland. So that, that's why I like Greenland. It's a very special place. Yeah, well, definitely can see why. Oh, goodness me. What a yeah, place. Yeah. 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 So like I said, Paul invited me onto this trip um, to Antarctica. So uh, I met the other six, I think, across in Auckland. And we flew across to San Diego, then Buenos Aires, and down to Ushuaia. Eventually hopped onto a, a yacht in um, Ushuaia down the, the Beagle Channel and pointed south across the Drake Passage, which is infamous for some pretty rough seas, but we motored for four days <laughs> in flat water. Um, yeah. And down the Antarctic Peninsula, so that the blue line is the yacht line. So it did about 2,500 kilometres in the yacht, by which time I decided I didn't like yachts. <laughs> and um, the red line was 300 kilometres down the Antarctic Peninsula. Yeah. So you can just see... The red line here. We started off at Enterprise Island and made our way down quite a, quite a few places. That coastline is so rugged. It's impressive. So, what, yeah. so this was summer again. This was yeah. summer again. This was in uh, February. I think we spent nearly a month down there, probably 18, 20 days. Um, and you, you've only got January, February to go to Antarctica pretty well, maybe March as well. Um, which is why when 30,000 people visit that area, it gets a bit crowded. Mm -hmm. That was the boat yeah. we went down on, the yacht. That was the same one that Grant was talking about when he um, went down south. And he went down oh, with yeah. Andrew Foley and Laurie Gagan and Stuart Truman. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we had the kayak strapped on the deck and um, nine people, what was it? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people. Yeah, travelling that down to Antarctica. Yeah. It's uh, heading down south. Yeah. Did you um, do Patagonia and all of that before you went down to Antarctica or you did no, that on a different trip? No, I mean, Ashwire is in the bottom edge of Patagonia, but um, no, essentially. Yeah. So that's still one for the future for a bit of luck. So as you're near the Antarctic Peninsula, you start seeing stuff like this off in the distance, which is pretty yeah. impressive. Um, 
and they're big, they're very, very big. And what mm. gets you is the thickness. This is on the mainland behind, I think. The, the thickness of the, the snow. It's just so thick. You know, there's so much snow there. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> it creates its problems, though. Jeff, I um, just had a question on YouTube about, um, in, I guess, in, in any of your travels, if you've had any issues with orcas or whales or any sort of encounters that way? Um, not down here. We, we did have uh, the next day after this, um, we had quite a few humpbacks um, swimming around us uh, on, in the water there, which was pretty, pretty good. They weren't terribly close. Didn't see any orcas. Um, I have paddled with orcas in Johnson Strait in um, British Columbia, Van off Vancouver Island. That gets your attention because their fins are so high, but uh, they didn't give us any grief. Um, and I've also paddled, I paddled uh, quite a few years ago up the west coast of Fraser Island to a place, a um, particular bay on the northern end of Fraser Island where all the humpbacks congregate before heading south to Antarctica. And on that occasion, we had probably 20 or 30 humpbacks within a several kilometre radius and they were breaching and rolling and going underneath us, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> oh. um, we had a, a radio sound as well, so we could hear them, very, very noisy. Um, on the first trip in Greenland, we had a lot of fin whales swimming beside us. They're 30 to 40 tonnes, but they're not a, not a risk, not a problem. Um, so they're just nice to see. So this was... Uh, preparing for our paddle in Antarctica at Enterprise Island. That boat there is called a name which is really hard to remember. It's, it's the Governoran. It was a, um, a whaling ship that was deliberately run aground there because it had caught fire. And the interesting thing, this is in, on the 27th of January 1915, which was uh, nine days after Shackleton became beset in ice before his epic trip. Mm. through Elephant Island to South, um, South Georgia. So yeah. same, very much the same period of uh, period of time in history. Yeah, so we're all yeah. trying to work out how to get our gear into our boats there. And then the next day we headed off in pretty good conditions, as you can see. Um, that paddler on the left gives an idea of scale and uh, kept on going. And we'd been told by the skipper of the yacht that we could camp on Emma Island, which is here. And we got here and all of that rock um, goes underwater at high tide, <laughs> which is the problem. Uh, uh, oh. So the only place we could find was this bit of a um, bridge here, which was inhabited by fur seals. And they were not happy that we scared them off, but they <laughs> We put our tents on that. Um, At least you didn't have to worry about bears uh, anymore. It looks so no, no bears. No bears. Yeah. So across the bay, probably four or 500 metres away, were these cliffs. Um, and we stayed there two nights on that little rather low level ridge and on the second night I'm lying in the tent there which is a yellow tent on the left and those cliffs were carving every few minutes it's like sleeping on an artillery range you know <laughs> and I'm lying there thinking if a really big block comes down we're probably going to get blasted off this ridge <laughs> so, I'm wondering about that it's yeah, it was impressive very, very impressive. And how, how tall do you reckon that would be? That must, I mean, there's a bit of compression oh, there, but it still must yeah. be, you know, it's, tens of metres high. I'd say 60, 70 metres or something. Yeah. Very, very high. Really, very high. That's amazing. And then we, we continued paddling further south. Um, some a little closer to the ice than I probably would have suggested. Um, you'll notice the photographer's a bit further offshore. <laughs> and uh, you can see that they're fairly close in there. Um, but beautiful, impressive, and uh, and but, and a lot of the coastline is like this. You can't re you can't land, and, and that's the danger. The weather and the, the lack of um, anchorages and places to get off the water is uh, quite a problem. We ended up in Scontorp Cove in here. We stayed on the yacht that night. We stayed on the yacht some nights and camped other nights. And that evening, two of us hopped into a Zodiac and went out to, around the corner into the bay and got the odd shot. Um, mm. Next morning, beautiful. The, the sea ice, or the sea had iced up just lightly on the surface. It must have been a fairly cool night and we we're just sort of crunching through a little bit in places. And uh, we were heading to an island called Truant Island, so we're paddling along through this sort of stuff. Mm. It was pretty idyllic. 
Yeah. And then uh, got the truant, and as the sun set, the icebergs went green, and they really did go green. We're all standing there saying, look at that, you know, it's really quite a remarkable colours. Oh. Um, and the, the forecast for that night was about minus 12, minus 15, but it only went down to about minus 5. Typical coastline. Um, oh. Not friendly at all. Yeah. yeah, that looks like carving city. Yeah, but the icebergs are just beautiful. Yeah, really, really nice. That much mood. It's unreal. Very much. Um, like there's so many massive ones. This one strikes yeah, me. Yeah, they are. And we got to one particular spot. Um, there's a channel down there which is sometimes called Kodak Channel because it's so photogenic because all the boats go through it. But it's also it's actually called the Le Maire Channel. But near the entrance to the Le Maire Channel is Cape Renard and a one kilometre long channel has opened up behind Cape Renard with um, the change in conditions down there. By the way, it, it rained on us while we were down there, which is, used to be unheard of. And so the skipper suggested to our group that um, we should paddle through this one kilometre channel. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, yeah I'll, okay, I'll photograph it from the yacht, thanks. So oh. they paddle through. And oh. this is there's a couple of paddlers down here. Jeez. Um, and apparently the... the, the, the entrance to it was more intimidating than the exit and this was the exit um seven people there in kayaks oh yeah no that's a no from me oh. <laughs> I, I want to comment, but you know what i'm thinking <laughs> um oh, ridiculous. It, it was an interesting thing to watch um one of those people was the skipper of the yacht too <laughs> kind of like don't anybody sneeze there, yeah right. yeah up. So this, this is um, after we carried on, we're going up through the Lemaire Channel and you just get this sort of stuff, left, right and centre. Went through the channel, had to navigate through a whole pack of icebergs to get to um, the next anchorage, which, which was at Hobgard Island. And often the distance is a bit of a storm behind the icebergs. And uh, Ooh, we're the next morning. And, and you get the odd wow. iceberg that's worth, worth the effort, you know. Uh. And then we, we finally got down to Winter Island, um, which was that building there is a, a recreation of, of what was called Wordy House, which was um, John Ryan's northern base camp. And uh, so we camped there for a couple of nights. And, and out through here, there's a channel out there past that cliff line, goes out to the bigger fjord. And you've got this big crack in that edge of that cliff. So we'd, we'd go across to that and we'd all line up. Um, and one person at a time would sprint through, so you'd sort of lower the lower the consequences if anything went wrong. Because that cliff collapsed about four years ago. It was on YouTube, and there was block size houses on the other side of the channel. Oh. Um, and yeah, so you go across that fjord on the outside, and there's an island out there called Ulua Island, which uh, was one of the few places around that I saw with lichen on it. So mm. I took the opportunity um, back at the the tent side on Winter Island. And uh, one of the locals, <laughs> Fur Seal, never clean their teeth. Um, fairly bad news if they bite you, and they're quite aggressive, so you, you get a, likely get quite an infection. And, uh, yeah, so that, that was um, Antarctica. Um, yeah, quite an impressive place. Overall impression, apart from the beauty of it, is it's a very dangerous place to paddle. <laughs> Mm. Um, things can go seriously wrong. We had one day there when we left that first uh, campsite where we had to scare, scare the fur seals off. We we weren't able to get communications with the yacht, so we couldn't get a weather forecast. And we stayed there for two nights. And on the on the third day, we headed off without a forecast. And once again, we'd been told we could camp in a place called um, Anna Cove. So we. We paddled across and it was a bit bouncy, a bit windy and getting windier. And we got across to Anna Cove and it was just a, a big base <clears throat> surrounded by those same huge ice cliffs. Um, and we thought, oh, have we got the right cove? And we looked at the map and we thought, yeah, we definitely got the right place. And we just have to keep on going. And we, we couldn't contact the yacht and it just got windier and windier and windier. And it turned out um, we were getting hit by catabatic winds and we were paddling down this fjord and I saw a 
a, a wind gust off in the distance a couple of kilometres away and it lifted a sheet of water several hundred metres in the air, you know, and it must have been 50 or 60 knots. And I thought, oh, we're sort of, we, we're struggling a bit here. It's not looking good. Mm. And uh, we finally managed to get a, a sat phone call through to the yacht and organised to meet them behind Cuvia Island. Yeah. And so, but then we had to get there ourselves. So we ended up across on, on the on the side of a fjord and the fjord was about two kilometres across to get to the island we needed to get to. There was a wind coming down off the glacier behind us. Pretty cold, I might add. Um, that was blowing at about 40 knots. It was getting pretty bumpy on the water. There were um, truck-sized blocks of ice in the water, floating at water level. Um, oh, yeah. And we were surfing these big waves, trying to, trying to keep it all together. And I was paddling along thinking, if anybody falls over here, they'll probably die because we won't be able to rescue them. So well, we got across yeah. there. That was one of those fun days. Mm. So. So your experience um, in Greenland, because there was a bit more landing areas and, <clears throat> and you know, probably the mountains are probably on a different scale there as well in Greenland? Yeah, they are. I mean, it's, it's spectacular in both locations, but um, it's certainly more places to get off the water. There's more, you, know, you can almost say there's more variety in a way in Greenland and it's got culture as well. Mm. Um, it's, it's certainly my favorite place but you know that's is there more wildlife in Antarctica when we went there there was less than I expected um most of the penguins were out at sea so the colonies were pretty thin and pretty empty um we only saw one elephant seal saw a fair few fur seals and um crab eater seals the daily penguins um there was a fair bit we saw didn't see any orca saw a few humpback whales but it wasn't as if the place was teeming with wildlife. Um, yeah. yeah so, some people uh, describe the difference between the Arctic and Antarctic is around the wildlife. Yeah, but I also think you, know, you see these wildlife programs, and obviously they're condensing probably a few years' effort into one hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think there's also hot spots like Elephant Island and other places yeah, like yeah, that. Where... That's right. That's right. And, and South Georgia. And, South Georgia. Yeah. You know, it's just, just crazy with wildlife. Mm. Yeah, for, uh, this might not be a question you can answer, but did you find any difference in the quality of light between the Arctic and the Antarctic? Yeah, I'd, I'd say the Arctic just felt warmer. Um, it was a, a really warm light. Um, the Antarctic light, we only had three or four sunny days. The rest of the time it was cloudy. Um, and it was, it was a pretty dull cloudy. You know, so, yeah, I, I would say that the, the northern light was warmer. warmer. Were they a similar latitude from the pole? Um, like, no, yeah. well, that, that's right. I mean, yeah. with the northern trips, um, with the last trip, we got to about oh, 50 or 60 metres, 50 or 60 metres, 50 or 60 kilometres from uh, the Arctic Circle. Um, I've been above the Arctic Circle and other places before that. Um, with the Antarctic trip, we were not that far south. We certainly weren't near the Antarctic or the, the polar circle. Okay. Interesting. So, so the other thing people tend to ask me is, you know, did you see Northern Lights and, and the Antarctic Peninsula and uh, Southern Lights? Um, the Antarctic Peninsula doesn't get Southern Lights. It's just in the wrong place altogether. Yeah, there's that um, weird sort of gap where it just sort of bypasses um, yeah, South America and all of that. Yeah, um, yeah that's right. We're so lucky here in, in Tassie and in, in New Zealand to be able to see it. So it certainly is. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. um, that's the, the cold places paddle. So I've got a few photos here from Tasmania and we've got a 17, 18 minutes left, I think. So yeah, sounds great. A few more images. So um, I reckon most people would recognise where that was. Well, you three yeah. would recognise where that yeah. was. We don't, we don't say where it is, but we do recognise where it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up the, out the, the west. Yeah, the west coast of Tassie. Coast. Absolutely magic. This is... Uh, not that far away. It's, it's really funny. I've, I've got this photo and I've been back two or three times since and it's always underwater. So it's... Um, yeah, it's I was like, going to say, yeah. It's low tide image only. Mm. And uh, yeah, the Tarkine's a pretty good spot. Yeah, I love eh? those trees. Yeah. And this was... Um, mm. on a, uh, we had a... Uh, a bunch of us went out to the Tarkine in... Gee, I've forgotten when it is. 1990 or something. Um, to grab images for a book called Tarkine. Um, yeah, it was 2004, Jim. Yeah, it was a fair while ago. 
Yeah, okay, that's good. My memory's gone. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a great. I wasn't week. there. I just got the book. That's all. It was quite a, was quite yeah. a wet week for memory. Yeah. So um, that was with Joe Shemesh and Rob Gray and Glenn Turvey and a whole heap of others. I think um, that was uh, yeah, pretty good time. Dan, this is one of the images went into the book. Mm. Um, and uh, it's one of my uh, yeah, like favorite places. Cool. This was. Uh, Taken on with an Amir Seven on Six Seven Film Belvia, um, yeah. early winter I think, and it must have just snap frozen. It's it's really unusual. I've never seen. Yeah, it it's, you, you wouldn't see that very often. So oh, it's what yeah. it's yeah, it's all broken up and then it's just frozen again um, in a different yeah configuration. So yeah, yeah that really so is an amazing it. spot there. Yeah, it is. yeah, that, that it is. tarn. Yeah, that's probably on the same trip. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and this is a lot more recently. I mean, the, the walls is a nice place, but it's getting a bit mm. overrun at the moment. Anyway. Um, what, what makes you say that? Like, is it overrun at the moment by tourism or because of the threats? Of... Uh, there's a lot of people going in there. And, yeah, it, it, it's a really busy place. But, I mean, it has been a busy place for a long time. And, and amazingly, it can hide people really well. Um, mm. <laughs> I went in there once for a weekend. A long, long time ago, and I, I counted the number of people that have been in in the logbook while yes. I was in there, and a hundred people have gone in, and I hardly saw anybody. Yeah, but I, I don't huh. care that Dixon's king of them all. Um, wild dog. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess there's a lot of other areas like Walls of Jerusalem as an area is massive. It's just that the yeah. popular area is um, um, a bit more condensed of good stuff, I suppose you could say. Yeah, that's so, right. That's right. But it's a nice yeah. place. This was um, oh, a long time ago. I went out to Frenchman's, and it's there in the past. Uh, um, camped on top of Frenchman's at the time, I think. Good weather. Wow. It was good weather. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to get up top. Good weather. Oh, yeah. Bluestone. Love it. Yeah, Bluestone. Yeah. That's one a, of um, such a unique place, cool that, that beach. It's a beautiful beach. It's mm. beautiful. Yeah. I mean, Peter Dom was one of the first ones to uh, publicize it, I suppose you could say. And Yeah. Yeah. This is. Um, Winter trip I think it, it takes a special eye to get a good photo after there, to be honest, I reckon. Blue stone. Yeah. 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 It takes it's a bit of obvious, but it's kind of to actually get a really quite stunning shot is takes a bit of uh, work and vision. Yeah, you have to really pick your right rocks and the water flow yeah. and the light. Yeah. yeah. I think it's more picking the right time of year to get a really good shot there. You just have to get the sun in the right place. And, um, yeah, true. The place is north. Um, so it's, you know, you, you don't get that direct light. Um, on the rocks in general, um, but you can get on the cliffs yeah. on the side. Uh, yeah, but it's a yeah, it's a lovely spot. Looks like a nice cold morning. This one, yeah, it was um, actually late afternoon. It was oh, is it? <laughs> oh, it's, it makes it even colder if it's still yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> well, everything's melting. Up, I, a, a snowshoot out to the rodways late afternoon to get the sunset, which just got stupidly good. Um, oh my god. And then uh, after the sun had gone, I put my headlamp on and snowshoed back in the dark, which was just mm. perfect. Did not oh, have been bad. Yeah. Well, the old oh, family. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. This is a very old shot, actually, up on the roadways on 35 mil Velvia. Uh, look at that rhyme. Yeah, you don't get rhyme like that very often. No. Uh, and this is a couple of years ago, often. Um, Wool heading across towards Lake Belt and Belt. Oh, I love those um when the Waratahs have that dew drops on them. It's like little gems. They just seem to hold them so well. The problem yeah. with this shot was it was windy and it was a uh, pack. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of work in Photoshop afterwards to try and get that to be presentable because it was just yeah. blurs all over the place. But yeah, yeah. And, and it was always was a there. challenge. Lovely tree. Uh, yeah. You would have found it, you three, I think. I think I know where that one is. I haven't actually had um, like some nice moody conditions to photograph it though, but um, yeah. it's the one we sort of place where if you had some mist, it would just be incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I photographed this quite a few years ago and then I, <laughs> then I forgot where it was, which is really ridiculous. And I did several trips up in the same area looking for this tree and eventually um, I was just heading back towards the car and I thought, oh, that's a nice looking tree over there. And I went, got to be close. I thought, oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, old age, eh? So um, Luke and Nick have both had fond memories of this spot, I think. I know exactly where that is. And um, <laughs> it's certainly, um, it's it's very hard to go past that little spot. And um, yeah, it's surprising. Like, it's a very unique 
environment, very small environment, but I'm um, very unique for where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Fab fabulous crowd. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I went up there the other year, it was my 11th time up there, I think. Well, 11th. Wow. Yeah. Sucker for punishment. <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy up. place to get to, right? It's probably the second hardest walk I've ever done, I reckon, just in terms of um, the condition. I guess it was quite hot as well, but um, yeah, definitely a what, what major that? achievement getting up there. <laughs> What was the hardest walk? Um, when I was on the Annapurna circuit and I, I climbed up over um, uh, Thurlong Pass, yeah. um, 5,000 something metres. So, right. okay. yeah. yeah, it's getting up there. Yeah. Yeah, so this is um, up on top 35 mil again, a long time ago, looking at uh, what's like World Valley and the uh, sun rising over Mount World. Mm. Mm. Oh, look at that foreground. You've been up this one. That one is that in the Easterns? It's Lightning Ridge. Ah, right. Yeah, that's Mount Lot on the right hand side. Oh, it's looking from Mount Sir. Is that Jones. like Judd down the bottom there? No, no, Judd's on the other oh, side of that side. ridge. Oh, I got oh, it, right? Yeah. Now I got it. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's up near Lonely Tones. Oh, yeah. man. So that's, a, that's quite a hike to get there then. That's a good yeah. walk. I'd love to get back up there, but it's still closed. And do you walk across that actual ridge top then? Yeah. You um, work your way up up here from the, the second lake, which is yeah. um, uh, Lake Bacconi, maybe. I'm not sure. And then you work your way up here. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It didn't seem too hard at the time, but that was a long time ago. I'm a bit older. <laughs> I think your, um, yeah. your version of not too hard is very different for other people's version of not too hard. We've had this discussion recently, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it's definitely um, Tasmania's got some incredible walks. And unfortunately, oh, that's yeah. closed. I think that might be one reason that why places like Walls is a bit more popular now, because there's a few yeah. places that would probably disperse more people elsewhere. Um, and places like Frenchman's are also on a booking system and, and things like that. That, so, yeah, that's um, right. so I think that changes it. I was thinking about going up the walls next week, but I've, I've got another destination in mind at the moment. Mm. So this, this was up on the Eliza Plateau um, before the fires. Yeah, um, I'm frothing to get up there. Yeah, back to that lovely spot. Yeah, Mount um, Mount World, World Mountain, and uh, Lot's Wife. It's awesome um, how it climbs up that spot actually with the Mount World and Mount and uh, Lot's Wife. What's that? It's lovely how Mount Weld and Lot's Wife line up in that. Yeah, like, yeah. It's such a feature. Yeah. Yeah. I look at that yeah. and oh, I'm sure I've focused stacked that, but I'm still pretty happy with that front pandemic being out of focus. I think. Yeah, I think if it would be too, you know, be hard, that just naturally pushes your eye back. Yeah, it would be a tug focus. of war between the two, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I'm and it's it's interesting too because obviously the mountain to your right in this shot is so so domineering and what you would want to shoot but it's nice that you can spin around and and get oh, something else there as well so right. it's yeah. a fabulous place you can see a bit of frost on the cushion plants down the bottom mm. um yeah i think this might have been the i first love this one. shot of yours yeah um with mount, mount hayes in the back there it is you, you yeah. see mount sirius on the far right there i was yeah. on 35 mil i think i said I, was trying to think I must have been in there three times because I know I took the Mamiya seven and I also took the horse from six, seven, six, nine through. So, yeah. Lightly um, went lighter and lighter with the camera system. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Going to have, have helium balloons next time. <laughs> uh, so, this coast. That's um, This is just off our driveway at home. It's not our property. Oh. On a misty morning. Beautiful. Yeah. Emergency in the house. The yeah, so you, you're living the, the Derwin Valley. Um, yeah. Which is, for those that don't know, is, uh, you know, Near New Norfolk, which is north of Hobart, northwest yeah. Hobart. Yeah. Just over the hill from Nick, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm um, on the hill of the valley on the other yeah. side. <laughs> spotted, spotted this, I think it's on the Lake Leak Road. I was just driving past and I spotted it and hit the brakes. I thought that looks pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that Lake Leak. Sticks, Sticks Valley Giants. Mm. Um, so, to give people a sense of oh, um, yeah. size, how tall would those, those uh, trees be? Technical term, bloody big. Um, <laughs> probably 80, 90 metres, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tallest flowering plants in the world, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah they're fantastic. This, um, you can't really get this view anymore. It's all overgrown. Um, spreading myrtle. Um, yeah. Nick's been in there not so long ago, I know. Um, one, oh, one less branch now? Oh, much more than that. That, that tree is effectively destroyed. Mm. Oh, really? Well, it just fell apart under its own weight, did it? Or 
snowfall. Really heavy snowfall, I think. Ah, of um, course, snow load. Yeah. Enough that Rob Blake was, was was good enough to tell me where it was, so I went in, got a couple of photos of it. But, uh, yeah, there's some nice, other nice trees in the area, but that was the cracker. Yeah. Reynolds Falls. We go back to Reynolds, yeah. Reynolds as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Another toughish walk, which didn't seem to be tough at the time. Definitely want to get in there one day. Yeah, yeah. And uh, out on the Jacane Range. Yeah. Once again, Labyrinth. Labyrinth is a beautiful place, but mm. yeah, that was the last trip up there. Wow, that's a nice take. Yeah. Memories. Sometimes the black and white does the job, eh? Yes. Yeah. Phew, I know where that is too. Know where that oh, is. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Most people, drive, job, most people drive past it and never know it's there. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Sorry to all those at home that where we're sort of frothing over all these places, but I'm um, I'm sure you can understand why we're sort of glossing over exactly where these places are. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. It's um, it's it's really funny because as you know, like as you know, I'm a Mondo ambassador, and and I'm just having to get more and more vague about things as time goes by because it's um, yeah. people are getting more and more um on on the ball with stuff, I suppose, as well, and all, yeah, all of that. That's right. Um, but just yes, to, there's no real reason to to um kind of give people a you know, the, the actual place and all of no, that. No, I think no, you can no, still no, appreciate no. the images. Well, it's, um, it's, it's amazing how people will keep asking for stuff, though, um, particularly yeah. those that aren't regular photographers or bushwalkers. Um, there's a um, particular group, um, I won't mention what name it is, but a, a, a photographer I know put up a picture of a, a waterfall on it and said, um, deep in the Tasmanian wilderness, and this is only in the last week, and yeah. I reckon uh, there was, he, he got lots of comments on how beautiful it was, but there was all these comments saying, where is it? Where's this? Where's this? And he, mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't give in. He didn't say where it was and, and yeah. put on him because um, if it was anywhere that was you know accessible at all, it would, um, it would get overrun very quickly because it was. Mm. there seems to be a bit of a desire for places that have beautiful... Um, um, you know, streams and, and waterfalls and stuff that go into pools of water where so people can go and swim in them. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It there seems is a bit to be of a real top. trend at the moment where everyone wants to go swimming, swimming. Yeah. in these places. And it's, um, it, you know, that's fine if, if people can swim wherever they like, and that's great. But, but there's, there's one particular place, um, it's getting a run at the moment. Um, completely overrun um, called Parsons Falls in Tasmania and um, was completely unknown until a couple of years ago. And now it's, um, oh, there were just... Like just they need the to last, sell tickets to... Yeah. yeah, just in the last few weeks, um, there's, you know, people talking about 100 people in there. Ah, um, you. And, you know, teenagers in there swimming and people drinking beer and, you know, relaxing and sunbaking on the rocks. And, mm, and no uh, one more. And they, and they, yeah, and they wonder why people get upset about it. Um, I was back in the same group actually for the for the same reason. I wouldn't say where a waterfall was, and, and uh, yeah. So this was some um, was an old tea tree on Flinders Island. Oh, yeah, right. oh, gee, black and white worked a bit better for that. Oh, well, we didn't find that's, that one, Lucky. Yeah. Same yeah. tree. That's... Interesting shot because this is up where the, the cider gums are up at Maynard. Oh, Maynard. So, yeah. um, on the night that the Rivo Road fire started. Ah, oh, right. Right. Yeah. It was um, January the 14th, yeah, um, yeah and uh, oh, yeah, the 15th, um, same night, and it was just lightning all around. I didn't yeah. feel very comfortable. There was thousands of strikes that night. It was un yeah. unbelievable. 2,048 or something. Yeah. 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 Which so is was just unheard of in Tassie. And, yeah. Because there was no rain with it. it no rain. Yeah. 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 Well, I saw rain that night, like coming down below, like but it's burger sort of yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. You just didn't reach the ground, eh? Yeah, yeah. There we go. up on the in the southern cradle, and yeah. um, a bit you know closer to home. Bit closer to home, you should recognise it. Yes. Um, yeah. I love that spot. Yeah. We used to go up to walls. It's a nice spot, isn't it? Nobody else yeah. seems to be like so it's, it's good. Yeah, it's a bit out of the way. Yeah. And um, oh, last week, the other day. Hmm. This is just from the other day, this one, Jim. That is, yeah, it's from a few days ago. It was with the... Oh, I tried the, the Z7 too. 
Yeah, yeah, and and just incredibly sharp. What's what's coming into Lightroom without sharpening is just pin sharp. It's quite remarkable. Um, Andrew Andrew on YouTube was just asking if it's a single frame or if it's stacked. Do you do much focus stacking with your shots, Jeff, or do you just try and I, nail it in the shot? I shot? focus stack um, probably sixty or seventy percent of my shots. All right, this one's not. <laughs> um, this one's. I mean that that four grand ridge is still well and truly in infinity, and it's, it's a really heavy crop out of a, a larger frame. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I focus stack heaps. Yeah, I'm 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 doing a fair bit of it these days too, Jeff. Um, do you just... use the feature in the camera, or do you tend to still go manual? Um, I used to go manual, which, as Grant was saying on his uh, his time on the show, um, it's time consuming and finicky. Um, mm. But it's not too bad, and at the moment I'm I'm doing the automatic thing with a Nikon, but I'm, I'm finding that it's taking too many photos past infinity. Um, yeah, it goes past infinity, but it's it's very quick. It's just mm -hmm. bang, bang 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 bang, you know. So I generally um, find Jeff just on that. And other people might be interested with the Nikon's. Um, if you're shooting um, sort of between sixteen and thirty mil. Um, 14 and 30 mil, that sort of thing. That um, using the number four setting um, yeah. and yeah. about four shots, and usually the first three shots will be the ones you want. And you can yeah, that's right. Tuck away the fourth shot, which um, yeah. seems it's to be that's you, that's if that's an F11 or an F, F13. No, so not I'm jealous not. at all, by the way, that you can do that in camera, not at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> ideally, you're going to shoot it. F five, six, F eight. So you're really getting the the best quality Sweet out of spot. using, yeah. using yeah. the focus. I'm, I'm, I'm just not that fussy because in the end it doesn't matter. And it, it means there's too many shots to, to worry about for me. So I just if I can yeah. do it in two or three shots, focus stack, then that's the way I want to do it. And the, yeah. look, it's a it's a um I I very, very rarely did it before um I got the Nikon D850, which does it automatically. And as soon as I saw how good it was automatic, it was a no-brainer. But I, I, I don't like fussing around with um, with that sort of technical fiddly stuff. If it's a, it's a well, pain I tell, in the butt. I'll tell you what. Compared to um, following the sheen flood principle, principle using a view camera, <laughs> using tilts and shifts. It's really easy. Oh, I was going to yeah. say. Oh, yeah. It takes forever. I've been playing around with some tilt shifts lately. And, oh, well, man, it, it, you if you want what? something to slow you down, get a tilt shift lens. It, it'll definitely yeah. slow you down. If but you it is right very rewarding. Formula. If you get Sorry? the right formula, you can set the view camera up in probably 20 to 30 seconds. Okay. You get everything in focus. But you need – there's a particular scale you've got to work to, and you need a, a millimetre scale on your rail. Um, and it's – once you get a – process in in place it's pretty good it's pretty good so yeah it just takes practice like everything really isn't it, it does. um yeah. there was a question um the question followed up around the stacking was for the lightning shot did you stack that one at all no, uh, no. okay I, just... I don't combine shots like that very very yeah. rarely <clears throat> um it's only stacking to get depth of field basically yeah. And um, there was a question about me with the Sony with stacking. Um, I'm assuming it's for focus um, or, um, I mean, I don't stack lightning shots either um, or anything like that. And if I do um, focus stacking, I have to do it manually because Sony doesn't have a built-in function to um, do that, which is great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you still, I mean, the Nikon just takes the shots. You've still got to um, stack them. In pro, in pro oh system. yes, but there Sony doesn't have the automate automated um, doesn't change the focus point for you. Oh, you have that, to manually yeah. do it. That, that. It's, it's just a bit easier, you know. Definitely is. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it should, should be a no brainer with all cameras, I think, with having that function. But anyway, I, I've yeah. been I've been to this spot twenty times and I've never seen like anything like that. Is that Mariah? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that that image was put down as being the parting shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah good <laughs> wow so which is that which one is the is the maori chief was that one of those head headrests yes it is yeah yeah um it's like, no it's not gonna do it um no it's charles henry somebody but there is a, a maori chief's headstone there yeah. yeah so um i guess we're about out of time are we yeah, yeah, it's about that, Jeff. Um, if you had a few last shots you wanted to show, and um, yep. half, half a dozen of Iceland. Oh, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so um, 
this is on the I've driven around Iceland twice. Um, so you did a summer trip. Yeah, yeah, very, very impressive place, but um, mm. seriously getting over on the tourists, unfortunately. Mm, not bad on the shoulder seasons now, but I, I went in 2014 and then 2018, and between those four years, it was a, a massive change to everything. Yeah, so. well, that's right. this, this one would, would have been in 2012. Okay. Um, mm. This was in 2016. Yeah, that's the side of the road, isn't it, that one? It's yeah, it's just a big. cool place. Yeah. Um, I was driving. You're stopping every five minutes there, aren't you? It's just so hard to drive past everything. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I drove past this and I had a wife with me and I, we went down to Vic and I said, I'm just going back up the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Go shopping. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, love that speed. Yeah. Vesterhorn. Vesterhorn, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was nobody else there when I was there. Yeah. Not a single person. Yeah. I reckon it would be different now. Yeah, definitely. Is. They've actually got a boom gate there and you have to pay to enter now. So I have, they. Yep. Oh, yep. Yeah. So. Extinct volcanoes everywhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the so shot everybody go. goes to Iceland to get. Yeah. And when yeah, I was there, it, it wasn't too bad. There were a few people there. I went back one morning and there was virtually nobody. But... Well, I've got a, a rope around it now, so you're not meant to go over the rope and stuff. So it's um right. would have changed a lot. A big car park there and all sorts. So. Yeah. 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 Um. Oh, okay. Six shots. Seven shots. Um, this was Bass Strait. This was 30 days supply for the kayak. Wow. Month supply there. Not not of gas. We were going to risk Nice no drive there by the looks. All freeze dried. Yeah, lots of freeze dried. But how are your guts after having that many days of freeze dried? <laughs> well, I lost about eight or nine kilos, I think. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. This was when we left um, Refuge Cove, Cove on Wilson's Prom. It's 55 kilometres in front. And the funny thing with this is thick fog out there. It's hard to see, but. You could and you got across the shipping channel, so you can hear the fog horns of the ships. Oh yeah, <laughs> it, and you think, oh, that would be unnerving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it cleared before we got there. Luckily, um, this is uh, an example of the, what the tides do. This is between Hogan Islands and Deal Island. This is forty-six kilometre crossing. And for example, when we left Wilson's Prom and headed for Hogan. We aimed at a point 28 kilometres north of Hogan Island and maintained that heading all the way. So you end up side slipping sideways down to the down to the island because the, mm. the current's pushing you so hard. Yeah, right. Each, yeah, okay. each one of these little zigzags, these ones here, a 10 minute stop. <laughs> and this one was probably a, a 20 minute lunch stop. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the tides have caused some epic battles in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you get much of a chance to explore Deal Island? It's it's a place that I've always yeah, um, we loved spent to five see. days on there. It's, it's nice. Yeah. This is Hogan, which is really charming in its own way. That little hut's burnt down there. Uh, yeah. Went down a couple of years ago. This was um, when we left Deal Island, heading down to the 62-kilometre crossing down to um, Flinders Island. And I was looking <laughs> forecast from a guy in Holland, it specialises in sea kayak forecasts, and he said, if you don't leave today, you're going to stay for a week. Yeah, so right. the forecast was 15 to 25 knots southwesterly, and these photographs were taken after it settled down. <laughs> so, um, uh, it was all pretty busy for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. So are they actually, they're, they're actually sales, are they all just yeah. markers? No, no, they're sales. They, they help quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. Because you're paddling pretty heavy boat. Yeah, they're all fun and um, games until you tip over. Then it's not too much fun. Is that chapel? Yeah, then you've got to practice how to roll up back up with a with a sail out. Chapel so island. Yeah, chapel. We we yeah. called in there, had a look around. I was, I was the only one. Any snakes? Saw one snake. <laughs> um, didn't stay there overnight. Apparently, it's overrun with tigers. Especially its own species of tiger snake, I think. Ah. Over there. Yeah, yeah, but very docile, very big, okay. very docile. Apparently, yeah. And um, that's it. That's the end of the run. Brilliant, Jeff. Well, um, look, yeah. thank you so much. Um, it's incredibly inspiring stuff, and certainly some incredible moments there. I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking at um when I can next get over to Greenland because that was just um oh, insanely beautiful. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 I'll see Dave. Pick up, up and go tomorrow. What do you reckon? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. all be nice, wouldn't it? It's I, mean, really I don't know about those flies though. I think I'd specifically go at the non-fly time yeah. somehow. <laughs> August, September. Right. Yeah. Very easy to get there. It's, the, the flights have gone up massively, unfortunately. But anyway. Uh, so you, you, said, you said sort of end of the road, Jeff, but at the same time, it, it's kind of the beginning in a way. If you just retired, you've got 
you got every all the time in the world to yeah, that's right. come up with more adventures and more plans and ah, you know, what yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. just just on that um jeff i know you had a an epic trip planned uh that had to yeah. be canned uh, just explain what that was going to be oh yeah, yeah. i saw that, that post well, yeah. there now actually but now it'll be next year so the idea is to go to a lake in Siberia called Lake Baikal, which is the largest lake in the world, 700 kilometres long, 80 kilometres wide and 1.6 kilometres deep. And it contains 20% of the world's liquid fresh water. Um, being in the middle of Siberia, it gets a bit nippy in winter. So um, round about now, well, we've got a warm spot at the moment, but normally it runs about minus 30 to minus 40 and the top metre of the lake freezes. So the plan is to um, walk up beside an island called Alcon Island and then cut across the other side of the lake and it's 150 kilometres walking on ice. Yeah. I'm just trying to prove to my wife that I can walk on water. I mean, that sounds, that sounds like an epic trip. And we've it's seen quite a challenge, yeah. Like, yeah. I'll be taking a, a minus 40-month sleeping bag with me and um, they're going to probably um, modify a tent a bit. Is there bears up there too, or is it that all good? Um, yeah, there are. The bears stay in the forest in winter, and oh. most of the deaths they come in winter in the forest when bears get disturbed. Yeah. They, by all the reports, they're grizzlies. They don't come onto the ice, um, yeah. but the wolf packs across the ice. So. Yeah. Well, I think one easy. of the other dangers on people like, reckon traveling in Australia is dangerous. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. well, I think one of the other dangers you have to be aware of on Lake Bacal is, um, is getting run over by vehicles because yeah. vehicles photography across. workshops. Yeah, they, yeah, photography workshops. Uh, yeah, Tom they, they mark out, yeah, they mark out roads. So um, every night when the tent goes up, it's not going to be near a road, but the. the there's a couple of big risks I can see. One, obviously, is going through the ice, and I've, I've got these things called ice picks that you wear around your neck, and they enable you to get a grip on the ice if you do go in. Yeah. Um, going through the ice is probably not a good look. Um, the other one is losing the tent in bad winds um, because you've got to screw it down into the ice. So yeah. it's something that you wouldn't want to do either. So it's, it's a relatively soft adventure. I mean, it'll, it'll certainly be very, very cold, and that takes a different way of managing your body because okay. minus 30, minus 40, you can't make any mistakes. Um, um, it'll be fun. It'll be really, really nice. Uh, good challenge. Yeah. Is that okay. solo as well you're planning to do? What's that? Would that be I've, solo as well? That one? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, me, myself and I, we all do, always do it together. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I just find solo traveling, and, and as you know, traveling in the bush solo is, is a great way to go because it just gives you time to, do your thing as you please and yeah, rush over and all the rest of it, yeah. yeah. And it's a, you, you, I think your experience of the wilderness and being out there is just on a completely different level too when you're on your own. Absolutely. So, um, Absolutely. Definitely. Um, very well worth following, Jeff. I think you've got an account on Instagram, don't you, Jeff, where you post a little bit and he's got a, 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 a great website as well with a lot of his shots from his adventures, plenty more to see. So I think I've got his Instagram and his website listed on the youtube description so make sure you check that out and um, feel free i'm sure jeff wouldn't mind if you got in contact and if you had any questions coming for, if, and he's a very helpful guy so um but um yeah look um thank, thanks once again jeff um for for joining us and um that was very inspiring and very beautiful pictures yeah. and um we'll um if you enjoyed tonight's episode and would like to support us please don't um forget to like and subscribe um if you haven't subscribed already on the video and um we'll be back next week so um um and we'll, we'll same time same place and um until then uh, we'll catch you later everyone thanks very much yeah Bye. thanks so much thanks jeff. again jeff a pleasure, pleasure mate. appreciate it thanks jeff Cheers, Cheers, mate. Mate.